Our first panelist is Ravita Din. Where are you, Ravita? Right there. She was formerly with the National Film Board of Canada as a producer, executive producer, and then its head of English language production. Most recently, she's been working on a multimedia project that looks at the intersection uh, of violence and women. She will be discussing that issue with us today. Next, we have Nadia Zawawi. Wave, Nadia. Right here. She's right here. She was born in Algeria and has lived in Quebec, Canada since 1988. She studied literature and journalism at the University of Montreal and McGill University. She is working on a documentary called The Trial 2.0 about the whole debate in Quebec about religious signs and the debate between religion and secularism in Quebec. And she's finishing another documentary film for CBC called The Islam of My Childhood. Our third panelist is Janine Windolf. Janine, can you wave to our audience? Janine is an interdisciplinary artist working as a curator, educator, filmmaker, performer, storyteller, and entrepreneur. She has her Master of Fine Arts in interdisciplinary, um, Master of Fine Arts. Uh, she has her Master of Fine Arts interdisciplinary in media productions and Indian fine arts. Janine is the curator of public programs at Mackenzie Art Gallery. And then we have Jackie English. Jackie, can you wave? Hollywood Reporter's recent pick as one of six Canadian directors to watch. Jackie mixes themes of sweeping social change with subtlety, humor, and empathy. Her first feature length uh, uh, film is playing tomorrow. It's called Becoming Burlesque, and it was the opening film at the 2018 Canadian Film Festival after its successful premiere at the Whistler Film Festival in Whistler, I'm going to assume. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good guess. So. The topic here is a very wide one about violence and the Me Too movements in the entertainment industry. So I wanted to start with the whole issue of just violence against women in general. And I wanted to get Ravita to talk about that generally because that is your specialty, Ravita, talking about violence against women. Can you, can you give us sort of a broad scope of that? Okay, thank you, Sarka. Hi, everyone. So, I mean, obviously, you know, issues around uh, systemic violence against women is, is, as Zarka said, extremely broad. Um, and so to begin to even discuss something like that in the context of, say, you know, women's experience in the media is, is complex. Um, I've actually been interested in uh, the subject uh, and from the perspective of a documentary filmmaker, producer, uh, and, and my own sort of commitment to making films about social change. And I, I think it's been at least 10 years that I was grappling with the issue of looking at systemic violence against women and trying to figure out, so how do you, how do you talk about this? How do you tell these stories so that they're accessible to audiences and actually compel audiences to think about uh, the issue in a different way? And I, I didn't actually ever succeed in finding kind of the right formula. So uh, a few years ago, I decided to take a different approach to it and started to look at the data. Um, so I'll, I'll admit to you right up front that, that I have a particular bias around the importance of working with data and, and big data specifically when it comes to looking at how we work with social change. Um, and what was interesting to me in terms of looking at um, how as a society we've looked at violence against women was the fact that we have so much data, uh, in fact we're drowning in data, and yet it is often uh, the first excuse that uh, nations, governments, you know, people who are working on the issue use. Uh, they say we have no data, we don't have enough information, we don't have enough of, of, of the stories or facts around the experience of women. Uh, so one, uh, for me, what's really important is to, to, to look at the data and actually see what exists, and it is uh, overwhelming in, in terms of what there is out there. Um, the second, and probably the more important thing, is that we often find today when there are movements, especially with the prolific, you know, hashtag MeToo movement and, and all of the other hashtag activism that's out there, uh, the tendency often for the media, and, and I think 
public at large is to say, well, fi finally, finally women are speaking out, finally we're, we're turning the corner, we're here. And it's not true. It's, we've in fact had a sustained anti-violence against women movement for over 40 years. Uh, and, and probably far more than that, dating back to 1976 with the first Vienna Tribunal that looked at crimes against women, uh, all the way to the Millennium Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals um, that were recently introduced by the UN. So um, the fact is that women have always been working to counter violence against women. It's not something that's new. And what is particularly disheartening is that, in fact, despite all of the sustained commitment uh, and the movements for change, we've actually seen very little difference in terms of women's experience. And the reality, I think, today in some ways is far worse, especially with uh, how prolific um, messages specifically around hate and violence spread over the internet and the use of social media in, in propagating violence against women. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it, we commonly hear the one in three argument, one in three women will experience some form of assault. Uh, you look at women's experience on, at universities and colleges, one in five, and so forth. It's also interesting to step back and look at what that actually means globally. What's, what is that, the cumulative impact in terms of women's lives? I read a very interesting report that came out in 2005 from the Geneva Center for Armed Control, and it cited that uh, between 1.5 and 3 million women go missing each year. And again, not a new statistics, uh, statistics by any means. Uh, in, I think, 1990, Nobel Peace Laureate Amartya Sen actually had published his findings as well that talked about the millions of women's, women who, who are in fact missing due to, to many reasons, violence being one of them. So. Um, I became very interested in, in saying how do we actually start to look at this data and try and find new, a new approach. And my, my very strong interest is actually getting right to the heart of the question, which is so how does change happen? You know, and not just a change in the condition of women's lives, but transformative change, where there's, there's, there's actual uh, legislative change, institutional change, cultural change that impacts the lives of women. And I'll just end very quickly um, on the Me Too movement, which I think is phenomenal. Um, but I think that it would be very interesting to look at it, um, say, in relation to Black Lives Matter. They did a very interesting thing. Um, what grew out of that movement was an offshoot campaign that actually started to look at the merits of data and collecting police reports, for example, on which laws and policies have actually addressed police violence and have had an impact on reducing police violence. And by using that data, what they're able to do is come up with very specific policy changes that are required in order to make positive change. And I think it would be very interesting if you know, we, we talk a bit more about change and what's required uh, to look at how movements like Me Too will, will go to that next step. Following that theme about missing women, I wanted to talk to Janine. This year, there's been a lot of attention to the whole issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women, which has not gotten the attention it deserves. There are thousands upon thousands of Indigenous women who have been missing. How do you feel that the society is responding to more awareness now to this issue? As an Indigenous woman, uh, my grandmother was a missing woman from Waswanapi, Quebec, and had been missing from her community for, I think it was about 20, 23 years. Um, she, Can everyone hear Janine? Yeah. Okay. So she was in a domestically violent relationship with a husband who had been part of the residential school system and unfortunately left the school with cycles of violence that led to violence in their domestic situation. And so growing up, I didn't actually know that my family was, I guess, lost or, well, she was not found. So like living with that reality, like you don't see it as abnormal because missing women and men are very normal in indigenous world. I have a grandfather who's been missing and 
these are things that we just live with and learn to cope. But before we did it alone, or we didn't talk about it at all, or there was shame attached to it. So I feel like after, in just recent years, now that more people are advocating, understanding that it has opened up a space for us to share and talk about these experiences. But it also becomes a theme thematically in a lot of films. And, and so how it's explored, that's often where I find very interesting because even I did a short, um, my master's more questions than ancestors was actually looking at how that legacy impacted us. And one of the stories was looking at my great grandfather who spent all those years till he died searching for her. And I was really aware that in exploring this, I was opening up old wounds. And so I wanted to make sure that if I'm going to open up wounds, I'm going to to also help in the use it as a tool for healing. So while the story itself is a very painful story, what it did was it allowed the current generation to come together to create this film, but also it helped us to understand our legacy and our connection to her and that story. And I've seen other documentaries who really just want to highlight the violence, but the violence is one thing, and I'm speaking as someone who's overcome domestic violence in my own life. It's the walking away where the where where it really hurts. It's not even in the moment of violence that you're thinking about that this is, you know, you kind of live with it and accept it, but as soon as you decide that you don't want that anymore, there's this gap in your life and that healing journey after leaving that situation. That to me was the most interesting part. And it took many, many years so that I could feel like I'm whole again and that I'm starting to heal. But I find I get triggered watching some of the news media and how it's presented. And I'm not alone in these representations. So while it's really wonderful that we have more awareness, more people advocating, allies coming and supporting the cause, it's just important to take great care to remember that there's people still living with the impact and can easily be triggered with our stories and our attempts to create awareness. So I think the more we actually talk to people and get to know what their journey is like and how to best represent them, I think if we aren't consulting with these survivors we're representing, then we're also continuing a different form and I don't want to say violence, but we're continuing that abusive cycle by disjointing their voice from their whole story. So there's pros and cons to everything, but I, I'm encouraged that we don't have to feel alone anymore. And I think that's the most important outcome. So Nadia, the, the Me Too movement has been universal across the world. And we've heard a lot of stories in North America, First Nations community. What can you tell us about the Middle East? I was really happy when I was seeing all the stories and I was following the Arab world. I thought it would trigger something. Um, so, uh, because there's a lot of violence. I mean, I've been making films. I, I grew up in a society where violence towards women is normal. There's all kinds of saying, uh, you beat up your wife once in a while. If you don't know it, she, she knows why. Or this, it's just like normal and then uh, making films like my first film is called Nadia's Journey and it's a film where I go back to my native village or where I meet the women I grew up with, the girls I went to school with and it was a film about uh, understanding patriarchy from within and uh, when I was filming like when the camera was off women would tell me these crazy stories about violence like you have no idea how bad it could get. Um, and, uh, and the thing is, to get these women to talk on camera was very hard because, you know, they, even if they, sometimes they are not there divorced or they still have their cousins or their brothers because women always represent the name of the family. So you have all this honor thing. So uh, I think that's what happened with the Me Too movement in the Arab world. Like in the beginning, they started... Uh, 
anonymously uh, talking about it, but you never see, for example, in Egypt, or uh, you never see like uh, women who are in the um, in the cinema world or public women talk about it. And then mostly the stories we could read were all anonymous. Um, so it was not as uh, it didn't it was not as widespread as in the West, but in the same time, I think uh, you were talking about uh, what would be the solution. I think one thing that happened is that these anonymous women telling their stories, I think they touched so much the people that they started understanding what uh, violence towards women was or sexual harassment. And I think that triggered a little change. So storytelling is so important. Um, and, uh, and also when you talk about these issues like uh, uh, sexual harassment or violence made to women, it's it's as if people think it's okay, but it's not okay to talk about it. But when you start talking about it, then you're the big enemy. Or they just tell you, oh, look at the West, they, they talk about it, they, it's so bad over there that why do you compare it to us, or we're okay, we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. So then, when I did my film, Nadia's Journey, I was like really criticized, the Salman Rushdie of Algeria, for a while, uh, because I was one of the first women who did a documentary and who questioned our, um, our uh, traditions. Uh, and uh, and uh, I th but after a few years, it really triggered real debates about, about the situation of women and violence and everything. Jackie, I wanted to segue. Um, Jackie and I did an interview about the whole issue of filmmakers and female filmmakers and how when you look at the graphs of budgets of films, the ones at the very top versus the ones at the very bottom, there are lots of women directors out there at a certain level, but we get to a certain level, um, 40 million and above, that number just drops like a rock. and. The issue that's come up is why is it that producers, when it comes to trusting women with a large amounts of money, there seems to be an issue. What would you say to that? Yeah, in, uh, in listening to uh, some of the comments that are made up here, I think that um, I, I'm fortunate to sort of operate in a world where the sort of direct uh, Violence is no longer a threat um, in general, and of course, if it, I mean, not that it doesn't happen, but it's definitely like poorly regarded in the in the world that the culture that sort of you know the artsy people of Toronto <laughs> um, certainly don't. I don't. I don't operate in a world where any of that is condoned, um, and, and everyone is generally super positive about these movements and super positive about women and, and super positive about people's career, and yet. Even with all this sort of like positivity, there still seems to be this like sort of failure of imagination to actually like trust a, a particular a particular kind of woman with with the larger amounts of money. And it's, and, and if you follow the money, this it's it's not it's not being distributed. I don't know if it's like we just not like in the sort of whole like bro thing when they're like doling it out, but. Um, screenplay writers and, and that kind of thing, you find a lot of women at the lower level and part of it is is sort of getting in yet that first crack. Like, you, there are women directors, there's some fantastic women directors who work a lot. I just, um, I just spent a great deal of time with, you know, Ann Wheeler, who's, um, the woman is 72, she has like 70 credits on IMDb, she's on 45 features and she, there's no problem getting respect from anyone in this country as a director. Um, and her, strategy was just to not pay attention to any of that in her own words. Uh, so it, it's not like it's Im impossible. So if you're looking to hire more female directors, there's people go to that. They go to the people who have all these credits. But what do you do to sort of convince people that you're going to be able to run the machine? And I think it comes down to less about the act and art of directing, like less, oh, can you line up a shot? Can you block some actors? Do you understand the story? Can you do all that technical stuff? And more, can you wrangle a team of maybe a hundred mostly guys, and I think there's a there's a, a fear there that the machine will collapse or or um, rebel against that kind of leader. So whereas 
depend, and this doesn't apply to all guys, all, you know, it's a struggle to get directing work regardless, but I feel like there's definitely more stories where somebody does a short film and then they get a tremendous opportunity, and I feel like as a girl you have to like, like the level of, the level of confidence you have to inspire in people before they can go into that sort of network meeting where everybody's just kind of spitballing names and they have no problem hitching their reputation to your reputation. The amount of, the, like, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like this invisible wall, which I call sort of more than anything else like a failure of imagination. If they can't imagine you doing it, um, then they won't pitch you. And they can imagine you doing it once they've seen you do it. Like anybody who's seen me on set doesn't have that fear. But how do you do that without, you know, it's not, it's like a painting. I can't just paint something. I have to be in a room. I have to try that situation. So there's, um, there's kind of like a, a level of, it just sort of, like it's an intangible quality that is difficult to, to trigger. And that, and the higher up you go with the dollars, the more risk is there and the more, the less likely, even, even remember the big news item when like um, the director of Wonder Woman got, she negotiated like a, like a really high salary for the second movie and we're all like, what? But even her really sal high salary, I'm willing to bet is not even anywhere close to the top male director salaries. Like, you know, and everybody's like, well, she better do a good job now. You're paying her a lot of money, but it doesn't, it's not really an unusual thing with guys, they're used to making money. I've seen guys on films that are tiny, tiny budgets who do nothing, they just kind of throw their name on it and they get eight grand and they feel fine about it. And maybe, maybe you know, women need to demand more money in general, maybe we're more generous in saying, oh, I'll do it for less because there's not a lot of money in the project, but maybe it's just a cockiness to be like, no, I, I, I'm worth more, I don't know. Ravita, it's interesting what Jackie said because there was a recent article in the New York Times that said women should demand more money and be more aggressive, yet when they've done that study, they found women get punished for demanding more money by both men and women. Can you comment about that? Um, yeah. Is this one? You know what, we're just switching. Oh, just wait. That one needs some batteries. I think this one needs some batteries. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's it's a, it's such a complex issue because, well, the way I would put it is, I think women are actually in a constant state of fight. It, you know, you're doing creative work, but you are countering systemic discrimination all all along the way, and sometimes it can be in very subtle forms. You know, and you feel that you are working with really good teams and colleagues, but uh, in fact, you are fighting every step of the way. And I think it's a really tricky balance in terms of, of saying to women and, and in, in effect putting the onus on women to be the ones who need to change, right? It's, uh, to, you know, there, there's some parallels. You know, a woman can be in a situation where she is being battered and people say, well, why didn't she leave, you know, as opposed to why didn't he stop? Um, so, you know, my own experience working as a producer and as an executive producer, uh, you know, and, and going back, uh, you know, at least 10, 15 years when we were actually, we hadn't arrived at a more sophisticated way of looking at uh, women's role in representation in media, one of the things that struck me immediately as, as I, I plunged into this work was that Probably for every 10 calls that I got from men, there was maybe one woman who was approaching me. And the tendency, you know, to in, in institutions, and certainly where I worked, was to say, well, we just don't know where the women are. We, you know, we don't, we don't hear from them. And uh, my approach was, well, I'll go to them, you know. I, so, so uh, the way that I started to try and counter some of that was to start calling the women, saying, where are you? What are you doing? What kind of work are you doing? Come see me. And I think I learned <laughs> over the years in terms of trying to really address that type of systemic discrimination um, in ensuring that women's voices were heard was to be extremely vigilant. And it, it sounds kind of simplistic, but it actually required 
people in leadership positions to say it's not good enough. So when women's voices aren't there, when the proposals aren't on the table, when a director comes to you with you know, a key cast of characters for a film or documentary and there are no women, you say it's not good enough. Um, but that kind of vigilance, it's, it, it's extremely demanding, but I actually think it's extremely important and, and that's what will actually start to counter some of that. Having said all that, um, the, the numbers again are really disappointing. Uh, Women in Film did a report in 2015, they looked at uh, telefilms funding uh, for feature, I think, no, it was actually feature films and documentaries and web series. They invested something like $68 million and 17% went to women directors and even a lesser percentage went to, to other roles. So there's uh, a long way to go and the long-term implications are that uh, the stories that aren't being heard um, are, it means there's a, there's a very large absence uh, in terms of the stories that, that aren't being heard. Jean, talk to <laughs> Does this work? Jean, talk to me about the importance of female storytellers and how, as a woman, being able to tell story and have that voice in the media can help counteract the negative stereotypes about women. Okay. Um, well, just... You know, one of my first introductions after I graduated with my BFA, just to lead into that, was one of the first things, because I actually got pregnant on my fourth year film in my last year, and I was told, if you have that baby, you're going to have no career. And that was one of my first, I guess, things that really impacted me as to me being a woman and a storyteller and what limitation that I was had. So, you know, of course I, I had my baby uh, and he's 13 now, but that really got me thinking that if this is the model and this is something that's, if this is normal that, you know, people will, I know people have kids because I, we obviously filmmakers reproduce, but <laughs> but to be told that this is something we should be thinking about, you have that baby, you have no career. So that actually really turned me off from, I guess, going right in. So I, I, well, I have goals in education, so I figured, okay, well, I'll take time, I'll have my baby, and I'll go get my master's. And then I got pregnant again, so <laughs> I had another baby. And, but during that time, it actually really got me thinking and moving more into documentary as to, well, this is more of a pace that I can work in. I can still be a mom and I can still take care with the story. But I felt that when I look at my own role as a mom and as an indigenous person, but also as someone here advocating for Saskatchewan stories, that there's something about being and sharing that can really come and be highlighted if a person who understands that is sitting in a, in a position of power to help facilitate that because, you know, sometimes I would share an experience and really want to highlight what this particular, well, it had to do with walking away from, from violence, because I was saying that conditioning sometimes happens before you even get into the relationship. So growing up, I did experience child sexual abuse, and that's where my conditioning began. Why didn't I say anything? Why didn't you react? Like, these things happen in a way that you just respond and it might like in my head you know I imagine oh no I'll be vocal this is what I would do but in that moment you just your body responds and then you start thinking about it so as I started to look at the stories and what I want to tell I realized very quickly if I wanted to have that story come from a place of authenticity that I would have to to take on different roles not just directing but writing and mentoring and producing and, and doing things, but trying to do it all, you, you can't juggle it all, all the time. So, you know, that model didn't really, it 
helped with the authenticity of a story, but in the chaos of my life, it didn't help me balance everything. So it really, I had to build good networks and good team and know who to work with, but definitely that world view that's in place, that's something that will take time to shift. But just eliminating and walking away isn't gonna help. It's gonna take conversations between men and women because I think where I'm blessed is by having sons, I didn't wanna disregard all male and label them all because I knew that my kid's dad had to go on his own healing journey and because he was willing to have a healing journey together. We didn't get back together. That was not no, no goal. It was how do we be good parents and raise kids that they don't have to live through these cycles or see them unfold. So it took many years, but I think the hardest part was actually healing together, talking together, having family supper together to the point where I think we're way better friends now than we were when we were together. and. That, that happened over time and it was nurtured, but definitely as you, like, especially in a time of reconciliation, there's so many levels of reconciliation that need to happen individually, as a family, as a people, as a community, and as we go broader, it gets way more complicated, but definitely looking at my own situation, and using that in storytelling, that's where I feel that if anyone connects to those stories, that's where the authenticity is coming from, is that care and that reflection. Thank you, Nadia. Your work, um, following through on what Janine just said, builds um, bridges between different cultures and breaking down misinformation. How can you, as an artist, I guess, help women break down the b cultural barriers that are preventing them from going forward in this industry? Um, uh, well, I, I learned by making films that, um, especially my first film was really about the situation of women in my native country. And um, uh, I think lots of women saw me as an example of somebody who went through, well, I went through a forced marriage at the age of 18. That's how I ended up coming to Canada. I came from a very conservative uh, uh, village and um, and it took me a while like I went through domestic violence and everything so I had to work very hard to free myself my children from that uh, and of course you go through lots of um, um, uh, solitude uh, because you're alone fighting and you want to show your family that even if you're a divorced woman you can you know, take care of your children and make it financially and being a filmmaker, nobody believes that you you could live like that. And uh, uh, so I had to become very strong uh, to make it. And also being in Quebec uh, with all the problems we have in Quebec, unfortunately, we end up in a province. I love that province, but there are so many issues that we don't really understand in the beginning and that we have, you know, uh, so I was often said, oh, you're lucky you were given, <laughs> you were allowed to make a film because you're an immigrant. So I had to fight against that too. Uh, but making films, uh, I had so many women writing to me from, especially from Algeria, Morocco, telling me, oh, you're my example. I want to be like you. I want to free myself. I, so so it really, um, I realized that my, I, I had a mission. So, uh, and then I started making films just not, just not just about women, but as a woman, making films about other themes that are important for our society. For example, I made a film about Islamophobia in the US 10 years after uh, the attacks of 9-11. So the impact of, um, you know, the, the Patriot Act on the Muslim communities. And then I had people telling me, oh, but the woman who did Nadia's journey as a feminist, you cannot make a film about Islamophobia. So I had to break all these barriers and saying that you can be just a humanist, you could be a, a, a feminist and a humanist, because unfortunately where I come from, 
they view feminists in such a negative way that it's just women who are mad at men. And I try to explain, no, being a humanist is also being a feminist. So uh, breaking those barriers, and now I'm making a film about Islam, which is like really a film about the impact of uh, uh, fundamentalist Islam in the mentalities and how it makes people stay in those, you know, um, strengthen those very patriarchy traditions and trying to do it in, in a smooth way where I try to make people um, not confront them, but at least make them um, think and initiate trigger critical thinking. So I think um, the, I'd love to work just on women's issues, and I'd love to make more films about women. But I think making films about other themes that, that in a way, um, uh, make women in the situation they are in now, uh, I think it, it, it helps trigger that critical thinking and that awareness. So, but I have lots of women following me and, uh, and uh, men also, because when men have their own daughters going through sexual harassment or their wives and everything, they become very, um, very feminists, you know, so, yeah. Jackie, following through on women making films about subjects that aren't always about women, just films that are good films, what advice do you have for women filmmakers to help get them out of, sort of the ghetto of low budget independent film making and start making more, I guess, manly films when it comes to bigger budgets? I'm supposed to advise people on how to make big budget films? Yeah. <laughs> what advice do you, do you know have how much my film cost? <laughs> ah, um, tell us what you should do. I'm going to tell my future self. Um, um, so, to all the people out there, well, leave Canada, I guess, would be the first step. I mean, we don't actually make big budget films here, so men or women. So, our, our idea of big budget is like, you know, small compared to. I think Passchendaele was our biggest budget film in the city, in this country. And I don't think that cost, what was that, 12 million or something? It was huge, it was huge. Uh, I guess, I guess, uh, I don't know, I have to just kind of like cling to the hope that if you, if you get really good. Uh, I think we've seen in other, in other like arenas where somebody has had to like break into, you know, like, um, you know, the first, black baseball player, um, the only way they, they could really break in was if they were sort of better than everybody else. Like, if, I think if you can get your competency to a level where it's, it's undeniable, like, it doesn't, you don't have to be, you know, there's, there's this, 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 you need to be this good to sort of do the job, but then if you're, if you're like a girl, to get this job, you have to be this good. So if you want to get these jobs, I don't know, you have to maybe be a genius of some kind. But um, I think it does help I think maybe one of the re one you know what maybe one of the one of the things that could happen is if is just to get used to paying women more maybe women should pay women more because there's actually a lot of like sort of in Canada at least in Toronto um, a lot of women in positions of power in fact if you look at a, sort of all the networks you know um, the networks in Toronto almost all the executives are women uh, and of course every budgets are constrained and everybody's trying to like make a lot of good content on no money, as I'm sure you know, but, um, and then, but maybe, maybe it has, somebody's got to, got to try to like, just make sure that they're not taking advantage of a woman's willingness to go down on her rate because it helps your overall budgeting, even though you're paying this guy more, like, maybe you have to kind of just cough up the dough. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm killing time where I try to figure out <laughs> how to make a big budget film. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know, really to well. me it comes, down, it comes down to money. Like there's just so much enthusiasm. And to me, I've been thinking about this for a while, is like how do you, because I have so, like, I don't know, I, I, there's a film, film that I was involved with recently that was a, a tiny, tiny little budget film. But I would say if I were to calculate, I'd say about a third of this tiny budget film. And usually in tiny budget films, everybody's deferring everything, right? Because you want to put all that money on the screen. And a third of the money was above the line on this film. And most people above the line had never made a feature before. And then, and then they, you know, I got involved for a very modest sum to make sure that it happened. 
And I sort of, at a certain point, I was like, why? Why am I doing this? And it's because I like films and I like the people, and they're all great people, and I want to make sure that films happen. But when I saw the budget, I was like, why is there all this money above the line for people that are not doing anything? Tell us what it, what it means to be above the line. Oh, uh, above the line, it's in the budgetary breakdown for film. Above the line would be like the executive producers, the producers, the writers, the directors. So, like, and then below the line is like a production, like the people actually like making the movie. You need you need these people to make the movie, but but above the line is, um, or sometimes I guess I don't know, stars get sometimes get money above the line. Basically, basically above yeah, that's what above the line. The line is a budgetary line. So, um, yeah, so a lot of people getting getting a piece of the pie that are not necessarily I mean obviously direct, but even if you're doing a first feature, how many people here got paid a lot of money to do their first feature? So these are the things that I think about. Um, but I don't think that it's all doom and gloom out there either, because I do work on a wide variety of, of films. I was on a film, I'm on a film right now, and the, you know, there's a female gaffer, and the crew is very diverse, and, and it doesn't seem to phase anybody. And, like, nobody's really phased. If you get to a certain level of youth, they're actually not phased by the whole like, gender thing. But they're just they're at low budgets because they're new. So if we all just wait 30 years, maybe it'll change. But I need, I need something in the meantime to do. Ravita, you were talking about the, the issue of violence against women and how deeply entrenched it is. In Toronto, we recently had a member of the incel group. And it caught, I think it caught a lot of people off guard in that there's this deep, deep hatred for women that exists among a certain segment of the male community. Can you talk to us about that? I'm sorry, I don't know that story. No. The, uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, there was a, a, a guy took a van on, in, on, in Toronto, up on Young Street, like pretty north, and he mowed down a bunch of people. Of course. Yeah. Um, and he, he attributed yeah. his actions to um, incel group, which is the involuntarily celibate, which means they would like to get laid but cannot. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I saw that story and then immediately tuned out because there's so many like it. Yeah, I, I think that there are... Um, a lot of horror stories, um, and that kind of misogyny and hate is actually very, very prevalent. Um, so I'm not surprised, and uh, in terms of some of the research that I was doing, I was looking at how um, some of the activists who have spoken out um, very strongly around issues of systemic violence, the kind of backlash that they have faced and, and a lot of uh, women who have faced threats to their life in some you know, extremely ugly messaging in terms of, of social media. Um, so you know, I'm not really the right person to ask because I, I'm not surprised and it doesn't actually catch me off guard. And, and the, but why are you not surprised? What I, what I keep going back to is that I think, you know, uh, the internet has actually allowed the kind of anonymity for that type of really fierce hatred to thrive. I think it's, uh, you know, maybe a little harder to do it face to face, although obviously that, that happens. Um, but the internet is this perfect shield for, uh, for hiding behind uh, you know, either a coalition that, that is interested in, in, in perpetuating that kind of hate or, or just blanket anonymity. It's very easy to do, so I think that's actually made that, it worse. You said that violence against women is increasing in society. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know the <laughs> question to that. I, um, I think that as women um, ask for more, I think as women's status improves, I think, as women become more vocal in terms of, of their demands and their needs, uh, there is a backlash. I think that that's part of it. And I, I would maintain it's increasing, uh, and that's based on, on actual data that I've been collecting. Um, but I think that there's a, a perception also that it's increasing because it's becoming more and more visible. You know, obviously it comes from, from, from movements that are arising and women speaking out um, and the ability to disseminate information at, at a rapid speed. So you're, you're, you're actually hearing about things, you know, in real time that you, you may, not, may not hear. Um, but uh, I think 
the, it's the nature of systemic oppression, you know, and it's, it is coming to us in all forms. You know, we're talking a lot here about sort of the blanket violence against women, but if you actually start to break that down and look at, for example, how indigenous women are, are, are impacted or women of color are impacted or, or women who are Muslim are impacted, you know, it becomes even more insidious. Um, what's interesting is that if you look at human rights abuses across the line, the, the types of, of, of abuses that are, are perpetrated against women are so vast that the UN actually has over 50 categories just to describe incidents of violence. And I think it's important that we look at that, right? So that, that with every new horror story that comes out, it, the, the response isn't so much, oh, how did this happen? But it's, there's a continuum of violence, you know, and it's, continues, <laughs> uh, and there is uh, a response at times, and there is mobilization at times by communities, and there's an outcry, uh, there are marches, and, and then it dies. So, so we, we keep going through these, these, these cycles of, of resistance, and that's important, but that continuum, you know, I think is more what is, and the systemic nature of it that is so challenging, because that's not new. It's, it's what I started out by saying, well, we've been countering violence for, for over 40 years in many, many, many different ways. So Janine, I mean, the First Nations community, violence is not something that's new or suddenly has appeared out of nowhere. How has, how, in terms of healing, can you talk to me about the healing process and for a community to come to terms with it, with the violence that has been perpetuated against it and how to overcome that? Uh, well, definitely the first step is just to acknowledge that it's there and it's real and it happens and it's still happening. Um, but for the healing component, like there's, like for myself, it was learning to communicate because one of the biggest things that residential school did, it took away our kinship to each other. It took away our kinship to the bigger community and those communities are very fragmented when it comes to that idea and like for myself after I had kids and I, I have one sister who's my full sister who always says how many sisters do you need because I adopt a lot of people who to continue that uh, teaching of kinship and part of it was I wanted to build a community around my kids so that if anything happens to me, if I pass away today, that I know that they're going to be okay because that community of not only my family, but this extended family I've created is going to be there for my kids. And so traditionally, before the residential school really took a lot, like a huge number of students in there into the school system that was really strong within community like if anybody was being domestically violent to another person they would get banished from the community if anybody committed sexual assault to women or children they were banished from the community and so the community had a really strong circle around our children and when they were sent to residential school and started coming back, those values were taken away. That worldview started to get eroded to the point that that kinship has to be rebuilt. There's enough people saying that kinship is important, but to exercise that ability to adopt, to understand, and, and to also understand that when you say you're brothers and sisters, it's not just our nation, it's all people and extends beyond so I feel like building community is going to start with that understanding of how we're connected to each other and shared values shared space and how we want to protect our children all colors because a lot of the I find problematic today is when you label someone say a radical who are trying to advocate for um, 
taking a look at some of the pipelines and their impact, or you you put that language, you automatically think, oh, okay, that's not, they're radical, so they're, they're going against the norm. But if the norm is taken away from my grandchildren that haven't been born yet, their livelihood, then we are all doing a disservice to the next generations. And that's something that had been lost and fragmented when it comes to Indigenous culture that we're starting to reframe. There is actually a project called Initiative for Indigenous Futures that's starting to get people to start talking again about envisioning what their life and their children's life is going to be like. But until we start to visualize together, I think that's where the healing has to happen. So like I'm carrying a rock right now. I use this rock when I do talking circles. And I found that the talking circle is a really good tool to start getting to know each other. But it also helps because as I speak here, I don't want to walk away feeling frazzled or like this energy. I want to stay here, I guess. And so, cause I got to go home and be a mom after this and go to gym and do supper and all that stuff. So talking about this stuff does trigger parts of myself because even listening, like it's, it's more concerning because if it was just an indigenous problem, then, you know, that's one area we can work on. But to know that it's a wide scale problem beyond indigenous culture, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. So, you know, I, but I'm only one person, so I'm just trying to do what I can. But I feel like if we all start communicating together, a group of people can be a lot more effective. And speaking to actually what you're with the violence, and how the media has become a tool, it has changed the way our society shaped. Like, the amount of youth suicides is so much more prominent nowadays, and a lot of that has to do with social media. Because long time ago, I could make a mistake and I could humiliate myself, but it's not going to be seen by hundreds of people or if it goes viral. Like there's some things that once it's out there, you can't take it back. And unfortunately, a lot of children, and I've seen it on my Facebook, have taken that to heart and because they weren't given that circle that I'm talking about, they didn't feel connection to anybody else, have taken their lives and you know, as a mother and a woman, that really hurts to know that this is happening. But at the same time, the social media has allowed me to see the other movements that are happening for healing, to know that these things are happening. Like there's positivity, but honestly, when it comes to any sort of media that I've been quoted in, I'll never read the comments because if they can't say something to my face, then I'm not going to engage with that interaction. So it's just a personal thing. I know people like to read comments, but you know sometimes there's really good ones in there. But unfortunately, like you said, it's easy to say things that you would never say to a person face to face that social media gives you the comfort. So I think we got to reclaim the tool, but also understand that there's going to be those who use it in the wrong way. So I think I'm going to ask a final question. This is a very heavy, heavy topic. Nadia, the, the, the question of our time, as um, Janine mentioned, is, is how, how do we get along? How do all of us get along in different religions and races and backgrounds and genders? And it seems like it's getting worse, especially in certain places. You live in Quebec, and the whole issue with secularism and religion seems to be coming to a head. Can you talk a bit about that? It's very hard to talk after you. <laughs> um, um, it's, it's really hard. Uh, Quebec is a very complicated uh, province uh, because of their history. Uh, because they are just 2% of Francophones trying to survive in a sea of Anglophones and trying. And, uh, and social media doesn't help because whenever there's an issue, um, there's such a polarization in the social media that then the people who want to build bridges uh, have very hard time 
talking. And the media doesn't help. And I find that, um, um, I don't know if you heard what happened recently with the, the two theater pieces of uh, Robert Lepage. They were banned. And that's the extreme where we can get. Because can you talk a little bit about that for those who don't know? OK. Uh, Robert, Robert Lepage is one of the, the biggest uh, dramaturge in Quebec. He's an amazing artist. And uh, he had um, a theater piece that's called, not theater piece, well, um, it's called A Slave, uh, where he had somebody, uh, uh, Bonifaci is an artist who, who was, he's a, she's a singer and she spent lots of time, um, now it's very political, I don't know what I'm going to say. Well, anyways, that's my interpretation of things. Uh, so she spent a lot of time uh, studying the songs of slaves. And then she she sung those songs. And uh, when uh, I think Robert Lepage heard her, he decided to make a theater piece about that. The only problem is that amongst the the actors, there were almost no black actors. And then you had the young black communities who were against it, and they they did everything. It was part of the jazz festival in Montreal. And then even if the piece was the piece was amazing. Um, there were so many protests that they ended up uh, stopping the, the, the theater piece. And then the same thing happened with another one, I forgot the name, uh, about indig telling the indigenous stories, but there were almost no indigenous people in the piece. Um, so uh, there were a lot of polemics about it. And then it just I find that it just divided the society, but there were no real, I didn't see real like media where, who took the time to initiate real debates of what hurts and, and what is not well done in Quebec is that there was no integration or acceptance of minorities and immigrants in the media, in the cinema, in theater. And I started as a journalist 15 years ago yeah, and uh, I, I, I was accepted in, in Radio-Canada as a minor visi visibility. And the first year, I was not accepted because I was not visible. The second year, I tried again. I became visible. So just to tell you how <laughs> it's not that, yeah. So I did that crazy test, that three hours of, um, of uh, culture and the three hours of writing. And I had to, do, to fight with my ex-husband to be able to work as an immigrant woman and had two kids. And I ended up in this team. And the, the federal government was, was paying for my internship. That's just three months. For, for me, as, as a woman who comes from Algeria, I was like, yes, I'm going to become a journalist and show everybody I could make it. And, and then I ended up working with, well, I'm sorry to say it, but racist people. And who said, OK, listen, blacks and immigrants, we don't like them that much, but you, you're cute. And, I was, and the thing is, whenever I wanted to do a piece, they wanted me to portray immigrants are, as people who don't, who don't talk well or always problematic. I wanted to integrate immigrants in my reportage where they are just citizens who have the same problems as, as, as other people. And then all this passion of journalism I had was just broken by those people. And, and um, I tried. I kept trying. I kept an, a, a foot in CBC because I love journalism, but in the same time, I started making documentaries. I have my own production company and started working with Al Jazeera Documentary Channel and other channels. And thanks God, my English is not that bad. So, I. But it's just that because they didn't take advantage of that, those programs where they would have integrated, uh, you know, minorities, uh, people of color, immigrants. Uh, uh, Muslims who are not just there to talk about Islamophobia, who are completely citizens who are integrated. Unfortunately, now in Quebec, we have this gap where you look at the TV, radio, everything is white Quebecois. And uh, even if they want to talk about their sto stories, our stories, they cannot because they don't know our realities. So I think now Quebec is paying the price of that that uh, virage, how you say, the virage that they didn't take advantage of, but eventually it's going to happen. 
Unfortunately, people like Robert Lepage pay the price. So I'd like to thank our four incredibly um, generous panelists for sharing, you know, as you've heard, you know, they're very deep and, you know, the opinions which, which are hard to say, this is a very difficult topic and they're incredibly generous with us. Can we get a, can we get a applause?